All right, well, maybe I'll go ahead and commit the time to the Lord. Lord, I thank you for my brothers and sisters here. Um, the opportunity that we have to take an hour together like this to talk about things that are important. Uh, Lord, we know that this is not something that we've just kind of come up with on our own that we feel should be discussed or important, but it's really something that we see uh, very clearly in your word. Um, it was uh, by your very design of how um, this world would be reached. It's through um, passing on the truths that we've learned, um, the truths from your word and giving it to others. And so they in turn could, could do the same. So Lord, I just uh, pray that it would be a profitable discussion, um, that you would leave us with some things um, to take away and um, may it use the challenge and sharpen us further. So we ask these things in your son's name, amen. So, um, yeah, just uh, one of the things that, um, you know, you've got to hear a little bit from uh, the report that I gave in the evening. I think maybe most of you are here for that. Um, just the opportunity that we've had, it was a true privilege to be able to live um, 10 years with the Moy people. You know, we didn't start the work, um, but we joined the work uh, about five years after it was started. And at that point, the language, which was only, uh, only oral, had been reduced to writing. Um, and so that was part of our training as linguistics. And so put that in the writing and a lot of the initial Bible translation that was going to be the foundation for our teaching um, was already getting started, um, but we had not had any believers yet. And so, so we got to be there early enough to um, witness the birth of the first eight Moy believers. And, and then uh, a huge motivation for us in our language learning um, was to... Sorry about the heat. There's a fan in the back if you can turn that on. Okay, thank you. It's on. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, just a motivation for us to learn the language and um, get an understanding as quickly as we could was the, this, like, discipling. Like, seeing these young new believers be able to grow in their walks. And there was only eight. So I've got a people of a thousand. That's not very many. Um, but I remember distinctly in all of us, the whole team, we were super encouraged about that. We weren't like, oh, there's only eight, you know. Um, we really felt like this was just the beginning of what the Lord was going to do. And we didn't really have any clear picture of how it was going to happen. We knew that, okay, you got new baby believers, and these babies need to be brought to maturity so that they in turn can also have babies. Like, look at that idea. <laughs> like, you know, it takes a while for babies to become adults. Um, and so we knew it was going to be a, a long commitment. Um, the goal wasn't just evangelism. And we, going into it, had, had in our minds, it's going to take a while. Um, but a lot of this stuff was stuff that we had never done before. Um, the discipling part. Um, yeah, I've had opportunities to uh, even lead some people to Christ before that, um, before we ever got to the mission field. Um, had the chance to share truth in people's lives and spend time with them. And, you know, that's some of the organic, like, outworking of discipling young people or people. But, you know, it was... Uh, Oh, by and large, I'd say our experience was pretty minimal. Went to the field at 26 years old. I think I was, yeah, we were both, no, I was 26, Karen was 25. So we, we went to the field as church planters. So um, to, the goal was the reach and unreach people group. So in planning a church, the you know, what's required of a church to be a church, a local body, to actually function as a, a New Testament assembly with men who are leading and all that. Like, who are we to, to do that? You know, we're just kids, you know? <laughs> um, but thankfully, it's 
you know, it's a process of, of growing. You know, you don't have to have everything figured out when you get there. Um, that's an important part of the process, I believe. Um, God allowed that in our own lives, that we didn't have to have, we didn't have to reach some sort of pinnacle of perfection before we were allowed to try to be a part of what he was doing and making disciples. Um, we just went out in obedience and way over our heads. And uh, yet we saw him faithful and we saw him bring things in our, into our lives at the right times um, to, to help us along the way, bring right people in our lives that uh, would help us to understand what it would take for the Moy. And uh, one of those people was uh, Don Alderman. So I think he was probably the, the first one to purposefully disciple me. So he was a field chairman for New Transmission in Indonesia. A uh, guy who was from Florida. Um, he wasn't anything fancy. He was a guy that could probably pretty easily just get, he was short, so to get lost in the crowd that way. But he didn't have this like really out there personality or anything, but he was a very godly man. And he loved the Lord. And I think what won me about him was that uh, with coming to the field with all these ideas um, and like a lot of zeal and a lot of zeal without knowledge, he, he wasn't intimidated by that. You know, he, he wasn't like, you know, trying to distance himself from me or I wasn't being a jerk or anything, but you know, he just like, he, he wasn't intimidated by my ideas. He, he was happy to engage with me on things and, and actually in, invite my opinion about stuff. Um, and I didn't realize what was happening, but in the two years of, of spending time with him, he would take me places and we would do things together. He was discipling me and I didn't even realize it. I remember one time, um, two months before he died, um, something had happened, like it looked like our ministry was going in a certain direction. Um, and um, it, it totally just went, went down in flames, like all of a sudden, you know, and i um, skipping a lot of details, but um, I remember calling him and just heartbroken and crying and uh, he's listening all the way from Jakarta and I'm like 2000 miles away in Papua and talking to him and um, I don't remember everything that was said, but one of the most important things, and I think the only thing I remember from that conversation that he said was, don't you know that I've been mentoring you all this time? Like, I see something in you. Like, it, Rich, you, your world's not gonna just totally fall apart and don't quit, you know, just keep, keep following the Lord because I see something in you. So that's the only thing I remember from that conversation. And then, and then he went back on a short home assignment to Florida and the hurricane hit and the lights were out uh, at a four way and got broadsided by a truck and broke his neck and he died. So, but you know, the Lord, uh, he's really good. You know, he's good, good to us and good to me. And one of the things that Don left me with was a passion for making disciples because he, he was the first one to really model what it's, what it can look like, you know, I, because I never really, in my zeal for the Lord and wanting to walk closely with Him, um, I, I knew Greg like some, since high school. We're Greg's from my home assembly in Dayton, Ohio, um, and Greg's a, a real good friend. Um, but you know, as far as somebody who like, I think there's just like pour himself into me in that way. Maybe it was at a time in my life where I was most ready to receive it. You know, it was unforgettable. And so it left me with something that, um, you know, I thought, I, I want to do this for others. Uh, a little bit of, I don't fully understand how it all happens or what's happening even at times, but I want to give others the same opportunity. Because there's people out there who want that opportunity and would love to follow somebody, 
and people aren't looking. And so they're just being passed up along the way. Um, there's an interesting fact here about millennials. So millennial generation, you guys are younger than millennials, I think, right? Your generation, was it Z or? Yeah, I think it's Z. So millennials are generation Y, I'm generation X. So and then there's the baby boomers and me. yeah, Greg, Jim, what, how about you? What, what's your, or is it the, do you remember what your generation's called? They didn't have names for our generation. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think they came up with some, but I don't know what it is. But, you know, definitely a different, like a whole different set of thinking and values right today. Um, millennials, or Generation Y, I think gets a, gets a bad rap in a lot of ways because um, they're seen as ones who are not really will willing to commit to anything long term. Jamie and Elizabeth, you guys are millennials, aren't you? Yeah. So, the, this is not true though. No, I, did, I didn't want to leave it at that. I, okay, sorry. So Damon and Elizabeth, are, they serve in Indonesia with us. We're part of the same overall team in Indonesia. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it's, it's those who are born between 81 and 97. So over 80 million. But it's, it's one of the first generations that it's not just, um, it's not just kept to here in the US or North American thing. It's actually the similarities to this generation globally are unlike any other generation, like how close they are to one another. And it's because of technology, Facebook. So fads on Facebook, Twitter, or all these things that are out there, social media, that has really united a thinking, like a global thinking. Um, and so a lot of the values, even though they're from many different cultures and languages do, there's a lot of things that do carry over. Um, but one of the things that, despite, and I'm not gonna go into what issues that people have with millennials, um, but one of them is, is the, they say a lack of willingness to stick to one thing for any long period of time. But I think a lot of that has to do with how how they're led and how they're received by others. Um, I think that's a huge, huge part of it. Um, and so even companies like on Forbes, like Forbes magazine, says one thing millennials value quite highly at every level of business and government is transparency. Um, and the key to marketing to millennials is another article. Key to marketing millennials is delivering marketing that is transparent, authentic, and not salesy. So that's interesting. So globally, this would be, you know, this is just in general terms, but something that they value is transparency, like real people, like people who are willing to be vulnerable. Um, and I, I think that what I'm finding is that there's actually quite a few people in, in the assemblies and in, in churches who truly do, they do love the Lord um, and it's, it's not because there's somehow we're the last generation that's going to kind of hold the banner and and keep things going, but there's so much potential, and I think that's what why we're here. We're talking about the potential of the young people, um, and I, I think if we kind of have that in the forefront of our, our thinking, that there are people who, if they would only have somebody who would be willing to come alongside them and say, you know what, I. I see potential in you. Um, and we have every reason in scripture to speak that with confidence about people. You know, that there are people, the guy's intent for the expansion of the church to happen would be through those kinds of individuals, you know, through young people. Um, they're the hope for the future. Um, and so I think it's one thing to, you know, have the, have like a fuzzy, warm and fuzzy feeling about all that, you know, um, and think that's the greatest thing. But 
when it comes down to the practical nuts and bolts of, okay, let's now let's make this work. You know, a lot of us, I think, um, you know, we're, we've all been in places that go, so how do we do it? You know, so how is this supposed, supposed to actually work? Um, and I think it, some people are not even asking how we do it, to our shame. Um, but others are maybe saying, you know, how do we do this? And they don't see any immediate answers and then they don't continue on. Um, but I think it's probably better to err on the side of not knowing what we're doing, but to zealously go for it anyway, <laughs> than to try to have everything figured out before we're willing to take the step, you know? Um, in 2 Timothy 2.2, it says, you then, my child, you know, this is of course Paul to Timothy, right? Be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So you have Timothy who's to entrust something, right? It's the teaching, it's the things that Paul had taught Timothy. The things I've entrusted you, Timothy, the things that I actually gave to you to do, the teaching that you were to hold to and live by, and we see all the passages that Paul's encouraging Timothy in to not forsake the things that he was he was given and that that was revealed to him um, to carry on. Timothy, take those things, and, and now I want you to pass them on to faithful people. See, I saw you as faithful, Timothy. Now you need to take it to other people that were like you, so that they in turn doesn't just end there, right? And then it goes to the next generation that they in turn can teach others also. And who are they going to teach, right? It's the the obvious, it's the Timothys as well. You know, it's the faithful, and it just keeps on going that way. And that's what we're looking for, is we're looking for Timothys. Um, so I, I want to ask a question here, and if we can, can, um, can I have somebody who can act as a scribe for us to write on the board? Do you have any... Okay, great. Yeah, sure. What's your name? Miriam. Miriam. Thank you, Miriam. Okay, so we have a scribe, Miss Miriam. Okay, so the question is, and what what often has kept discipleship or training from happening in the local assemblies? Yeah. Oh, you don't have to. Well, yeah, that's okay. We'll just have it in our mind. What's, what's kept it from happening in the assembly, do you think? I think time is a hindrance. What, time? Time. Mm -hmm. Priorities. 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 Yeah. Generation gaps. Generation gaps? Mm -hmm. Desire. Desire. A lot, and a lot of this is, is we're talking, it, I'm, I'm, I'm receiving this, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm receiving this as the disciplers n not being desirous, the disciplers not having, giving time, the disciplers not spanning the gaps. It, it, okay, if I'm wrong on that, then yeah, we can make that more clear. Could it be both ways? It, I think it can be. Yeah. Well, my thought's the same thing. Who initiates a discipling relationship, the older or the younger? And I think that scares both sides a little bit. Okay. I'm, I'm, if I can be as so bold as to say, okay, I, from, from what I see, like a lot, of the, a lot of the challenge that we face, I think in the assemblies, um, looking around, is there is a generation gap happening. And uh, like my home assembly um, in Ohio, it's not getting bigger. So there's a number of other assemblies that we know well that it's not, not getting bigger. And as what, what's, what's happening, I think I'm trying to identify what, what is the problem. And I think it boils down to, in a lot of ways, the discipleship dilemma, like things not going on to the next generation. And I'm wondering like, what, so what is it? And that's something that, you know, I want us to flesh out a little bit together. Like, okay, what, so what is the cause of that? And it, and it definitely can be both ways, but I would, I would venture to say that when, it, when it's all said and done and 
and we are to be accountable for the things that have been entrusted to us and we didn't pass them on. You know, who, who is most responsible? Because um, I believe that we are very wealthy when it comes to knowledge and understanding a very, very wealthy group of people. Um, Paul. I just want to say, um, I think it's a desire um, about Sunday school too, because in our assembly, um, well, I won't say anything for us, just saying a lot of assemblies will keep the kids downstairs until they're high school, right? And they leave, right? And I was talking to a brother about that. And I said, um, are your kids part of the church? Or do you separate them? This is where you separate them. And I think that's a, that could be a problem, too, mm. where the kids aren't really given ownership in the church. They're like in a room downstairs in Sunday school mm. from, let's say, kindergarten to 12th grade. Mm -hmm. They get a good Christian education, I'm sure, but they're the good kids. They're not part of the church. I think that's how they feel in the way. <coughs> So maybe a pr hindering or practices that we do, like some forms that we do, can be hindering the. Right, I think philosophy of Sunday school. Philosophy. Where how long do you keep the kids in the Sunday school versus actually incorporating them in the meeting where you give them some ownership? Okay. You know some. Sure. And obviously, there's discipleship in that. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Good. Yeah, so that wasn't discipled doesn't they're intimidated to try to disciple somebody else when they weren't discipled that's right yeah yeah that's good hey David uh, complacency complacency we just get settled into our meetings and, and yeah especially the, like Brother Paul was just saying if the, the kids are in another another area of the building and get some instruction then well you know they'll take care of it you know and it's almost like that segment of the week that's replaced perhaps what goes on or should go on in the home mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. I think follow up on that there's mm -hmm. some of that in the for the adults too that the pulpit ministry is going to take care of all that we don't need to be involved discipling personally yeah. so we can do the same thing with the adults that we do with kids yeah no, that's good yeah what is that one? um yeah no <laughs> it's almost like okay that's to me it's almost like even though we strongly oppose a clergy lady separation mm -hmm. And yet we still, yeah, we still in some ways allow it to be, right? So we don't practically, practically own the priest of the believer, that reality that we are responsible. There's yeah. some kind of subcontracting going on. <laughs> Even if it's so, you know, subconscious, but mm. it's easy to do that. Well, we'll let the elders take care of that, or we'll mm. let, you know, somebody else should take care of it. Yeah. And, uh, uh, <laughs> Every mature believer, <coughs> man or woman, mm -hmm. should be on the lookout for someone they can invest in. Yeah. That's good too. Yeah. I think that sometimes it's not having the same vision on the leadership team too. So one wants to draw young people along and make them feel they're not ready. So also just not being the oneness of vision of when and how. Yeah. I think a lot of these have been focusing on um, disciple layers. This, uh, what would you call it? This disunity? Disunity. This disunity, maybe. <laughs> yeah. So a lot of these yeah, seem to be focusing on the one who would be giving discipleship, but we know that it's a two way street. Mm -hmm. And there needs to be a desire on the one who is going to receive discipleship. And then on that. I would say in that party, I would say there are cultural hindrances regarding um, really authority and truth, just in the sense like, wait, you know, who are other people to tell me how to live my own life? Mm, true. <clears throat> like, 
why should I accept someone else's truth? Mm. It's, it's a cultural hindrance mm -hmm. to the younger generation. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's good. Um, so, culture, um, yeah. the culture hinder hindrances. Yeah. And Jim? Mitch, what I was thinking about of priority is the priority of God himself to our hearts and towards the honor of the Lord Jesus. And if that is strong by the grace of God in our hearts, then a lot of these things will just fade away. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, mm -hmm. and all these things, maybe they'll come along. It doesn't say that. No. Yeah. No, that's, uh, I, I, I know you're not in any way, Jim, being cliche, and I think that we could just hear that and be like, oh yeah, that's nice, those are nice words, but I, I think that really is, that is a core issue, isn't it? If we could own the heart of the Lord, so the heart of the Lord is a servant to others, he was always reaching out to others, he's looking for the poor and needy, and he's always moving them towards, towards the Father, right? ourselves that's priority there's some of these other things mm -hmm. places but sacrifice ourselves I don't know how he put it but better than I can sacrifice ourselves and consider it as a worship to the worthy Lord Jesus mm -hmm. yeah. Bill yeah. for um, sometimes Instead of you know, one pastor, you know, there are several elders, but you have the you don't have the mentality of the priesthood of the believer. So uh, people can uh, expect the elders, in addition to devoting themselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. Um, you know, the elders are looked upon to do the discipleship. Um, and so, you know, the elders can think they're spread too thin, and then the uh, congregation is looking to the elders for uh, leadership there. So there's a, there's a tension there. Mm -hmm. I think it can be, you know, which, which comes first. Yeah. Mm. Do, do the saints in the congregation go and which direction do the elders? Yeah, so, okay, just thinking about that um, real quick. Uh, so Matthew 28, um, 18, 20, it's the Great Commission, yeah. right? That's, that's an under, you know, as I understand, that's to all, all believers, right? And but yet we make it. Sometimes we make a distinction about who it's for. Or we, or we even look at it as is something on top of something else. You know. Do the elders look? Do the saints do everything? Or do the elders do everything? Yeah. And you know, I think sometimes there's a mentality. So it's not a healthy ownership of. Let the professionals. Yeah. Let George do it. Yeah, so not a not a healthy mutual ownership of, of discipleship. Yeah. Good, thank you, Bill. Yeah. Um, transparency. We don't want people to see our mess ups and screw ups. You know, we're like, really isn't it perfect? I can be perfect on Sundays and they can have this beautiful I am this godly person, but if I let them into my life, they're gonna realize that I get mad and angry and frustrated and annoyed at the most littlest things that happen because the washer broke down or the <laughs> sink clogged up and the real reality of life we don't want people to see that yeah. you know we, we are sinful fallen people yeah. just like you are yeah. I think the younger generation that's what they want but they don't know what to do and they want to know 
how do I live with all the Right. See, okay, we looked at, like I was talking about the millennials, right? They, they know that we're not perfect. Mm -hmm. But I think that's the thing that rubs them so wrong is they already know it, but we're not going to, we're not going to in any way reveal that we did anything wrong or we would any way um, be vulnerable, you know. And so I think it, it's a disconnect. It's kind of like you, you're seeing all these things, you know, but I'm not really seeing it, you know. Um, or I mess up. Yeah, so I mess up. I know I mess up, but, and I believe you do, but you don't really want to talk about it. So I don't know what to do with, you know, right? There's, there's that disconnect. Thank you. No, that's good. Okay, well, whoops. Um, and we, we've been actually doing, I think, a pretty good job. Thank you, Miriam. Did anybody have any last ones that, like, Larry, okay, I got another one for you, Miriam. Larry, Larry's got one here. Go ahead, Larry. Uh, do you think there's a lack of, a, a lack of understanding of what discipleship really means? Uh, do you think that people think there's only one way to disciple, whereas it's as varied as a person to disciple? Yeah. I think so. So a lack of clarity about what discipleship is. That's there's gotta be a shorter way to say that, but yeah. No, that's good. And to expand on what he's saying, like I went through navigators and campus crusade and they mm. had these booklets that you go through. Mm -hmm. And so you got the impression that you go through the booklet with them. You've discipled them, okay. Yeah. You know, he got his degree, you know, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, very good. Okay, so we're we'll we'll touch on some of these. Um I think we have till five, is that right, everybody? Is that what you're saying? Okay. So we got a, we got a little bit of time yet. Um so we'll have these kind of before us. These these are a lot of times obstacles for for it actually practically happening. So when we when we think about okay, when God was thinking, okay, how am I gonna build my church? Um, and so he, he already had in his mind how it's going to happen, and Jesus gives this command right before he goes to heaven, you know, as we call it the Great Commission. And in it, it says to go and make disciples of all nations. And the Greek, if we look at it, that it's, it's not, and it's easy in English to look at, oh, the command is to go, but the command is actually make disciples. That's the only command in that passage, which is not a small command, because this is what we're wrestling with here, you know, the practically. But he says, make disciples. And it, the, the tense for the go is as you're going. That's the, the idea is like, as you're living life, make disciples. And which I believe fits perfectly with his design that it's going to happen through believer priests. So everybody's going to be responsible to do this. There's not going to be one person who has more responsibility to obey Jesus' command to make disciples than, than somebody else. We're all going to own this together. Um, I think it's super critical. Um, so that's, that's how it's to happen. Um, but there's, there's hindrances to that. La, the last, last uh, session, some of the other things that came out was, was an unwillingness to let go. Um, so the idea of like you're in a position of authority or power and don't want to release that, you know, that happens too. And I think we all can agree to that, you know, that there is those cases where, you know, for whatever reason, you know, we get comfortable or it's all we know and the next step is scary. If I'm not doing this and, and what am I going to do? You know, there can be all kinds of things that would cause us to not let go. But that passage there, when we looked at Second Timothy two two. Greg, would you mind passing those out? Um, thank you. Sorry, I meant to get these out. Have Greg uh, get these out sooner. I didn't mention it to him though. I'll end it. So, if you guys can look at this this chart that I kind of made up, it's really quite simple. Um, but it, this is kind of based off of Second Timothy two two. 
to entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Okay, so, you know, really, I think the target, really, it should be beyond us. It really needs to be, okay, I'm happy if they are just below me. What, you know, we know that's not the right attitude. <laughs> like, you know, as long as I'm always knowing, you know, one more thing than you, then that's okay. You know, we, that's not right. You know, we know that. So really the heart of to have is to see that anybody that we're pouring ourselves into that could go away further than we do, you know? Um, I think that's the Lord's heart. But, you know, looking at the bottom part, this is basically a, from the perspective of, of the disciple. So the one who's being discipled, the Timothy. So initially, when they first get saved, you know, they're in the bottom left corner there. They're just starting off and, and they basically need constant oversight. You know, we're not going to, we're not going to just let them figure out things on their own or looking at, looking at Google and trying to study the Bible and figuring out, you know, Wikipedia, you know, who knows where they're going to go when it comes to, we want to, you know, we realize that they need much oversight, just like a child. And then also, you know, as a little child running around too, they're not going to, we're not going to carry this big heavy load and put it on their shoulders you know, prematurely because, you know, they're not going to carry it anywhere. Um, they're going to feel, feel that it's heavy and they're going to just quit, you know. So it doesn't work that way either. So they, starting off, they don't have any responsibility really and there's, there's no oversight or there's a lot of oversight. But then, of course, as they, as they grow, we want to see them move up this, this trajectory to a place where they're able to, to take on really a full responsibility. And that's what Second Timothy 2.2 2 is about. It's like entrusting and where they don't need oversight anymore by us. I'm not saying no oversight by the Holy Spirit, you know, or, or no accountability. That's not what I mean, but I'm talking about true and trusting. And, um, you know, just doing a, a quick word study on that and trust in 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, I think it's uh, enlightening. So when Jesus is on the cross and he says, into your hands I commit my spirit, that word commit is in trust. So, Jesus says, Father, I entrust my spirit to you like I let go. I'm releasing. You know, and it, it's an amazing picture. It's the same idea in 2 Timothy 2, 2, to entrust, to fully let go, to release. Um, comes up again in Acts 14.23 when Paul and Barnabas are on that, their first missionary journey and they're, um, they're recognizing elders. Uh, it says, and when they had appointed elders from, for them in every church, with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they have believed. So they committed. It's the same word, entrust. So the, it wasn't just a random entrusting to themselves or entrusting to the congregation. You know, it wasn't anything weird ideas like that. It was like clearly entrusting to the Lord and so somehow, somewhere along the lines that has to happen, and that's, that's what this full responsibility is on, on this trajectory, is like those that we are responsible to, the Lord's put in our lives, um, who are within our sphere of influence. And if we have a, his heart to look for those to disciple, and we're, our eyes are open and we're saying, God, bring about Timothy's, because I want to pour into them. But that has to be the end goal. Because it can't be anything short of that. We, we see it, it's clear in Scripture, in 2 Timothy 2.2. 2, and it's also there in the Great Commission. It was, that's what disciple making is about. And so if we want to bring clarity to what this is, at least it's helpful to know what the end goal is, right? So if we aim for nothing, we're surely going to hit it, right? You know, as they say. So what is our target? And I, I believe that, you know, that's why we, we come back to the Word and we constantly are needing to remind each other of what truth is and sharpen each other to think about things like this because so often you get down to the nitty-gritty of life and it, you know, it, it gets confusing or you just don't see the opportunities. And, and what I believe, though, a lot of times is because we're, short-sighted or we're not really trusting the Lord for what he wants us to trust him for 
you know, actually seeing people that we can pour ourselves into, that they would actually take full responsibility. The, what I see in the, in the Acts, like in the, in the New Testament church, the Acts story, that whole narrative, was a church that was constantly changing. Constantly. Like it was either through persecution or through the expansion of the gospel. It was constantly changing, moving, and growing. And, and that's our roots. You know, that's what we've come from. And what I find often today is an unwillingness to change, unwillingness to move, and, and we're doing all we can to circle the wagons. When the wagons are, are supposed to be moving in a direction, you know, and, and we circle them, you know. Um, and I think it's killing us. I really do. And it, I think it's related to this, like, what is our goal? Um, what, is there any urgency to this? Because there must be, you know, the, the necessity. Um, if we are about just kind of trying to maintain and, and try to circle the wagons, and it really doesn't, whether we disciple or we don't disciple, doesn't make a huge difference. Really. Okay. The Lord, uh, a lot of times, you know, he, he gets something started in a place. So just talking to Warren Henderson, you know, he's, he's still wrestling. He's trying to, you know, got a meeting of about 20 believers, you know, and they're just starting from scratch, you know. said he's had people baptized every year except for this year. So maybe the year's not done yet, you know. So they're just getting going. So what can happen is Warren and those the Lord would raise up to help lead that assembly, they can continue to have the, the idea of reaching out, trusting the Lord. The reason discipleship matters to Warren in his context right now is because how are you going to have like a thriving, growing church with all the gifts that are needed apart from it growing, you know, and every member, which they're very few, every member actually doing their part and every member owning the need to make disciples, right? So you got a situation like that, it's like do or die. It's actually pretty urgent. Um, but it can easily move to something like maybe five years down the road where you got like 100 people, 150, um, you got elders established and you got things are, are you know looking healthy from the outside and a lot of things are functioning well, a lot of people in the word and I think it's that type of situation that it's super hard to like move to the next step of, okay, we need to, we need to not get comfortable here. We have urgency about the task. We don't want to think that discipleship is not, is a secondary thing when, when God makes it clear that it's primary, but it's those type of situations, I believe, where it becomes super easy to lose sight of the urgency of it, you know, the necessity, but necessity is the mother of invention, right? You know, and I think so often uh, what I believe happens is we lose the idea of necessity. The discipleship is, becomes a, a, a tertiary thing. It's just something that's not really all that important uh, because by God's grace, we reach a place where we are doing okay, you know? Um, and I think that's a dangerous place to be. Um, so um, maybe just use a little bit of uh, anecdote from our our story in, in Moy. You know, I told you like I I was only starting to figure out like what discipleship was even about, and didn't really get to apply it. But the Lord gave us a neat place to apply it, and that was working with the Moy people. And so while we were there, we we had it in our minds before we even got there that. Okay, you know what? In order for this to actually happen, where we're, okay, we're wanting to plant just not a church. We don't want to just go and evangelize. We want to see disciples made. Disciples who make disciples. Okay, so, okay, that's going to take a while. It took a while for me to reach a place where I could even understand what that meant. So it's going to take a little while. Hopefully not that long, you know, but we had in mind urgency. We... We're living in a place, living in a jungle, mountainous jungle, um, and we didn't live there because we loved it, even though the more you thought we did initially, because um, obviously we'd want to live there because they're so cool. You know, that's what they, that's what they actually thought, you know, before they came to Christ. Um, and, you know, we're away from our, our families, we're away from home, 
and we're about a task. And we're asking, Lord, help us. You know, help us to see disciples made. So talk about necessity. You know, talk about like an urgency. You know, that was very real in our hearts because we wanted to see ourselves fully multiplied in them. Um, and it didn't happen fast enough. <laughs> um, you know, that's the way it felt from, from our perspective about God and His perfect timing brought things about in, in the right way. Um, there were things that came up along the way. So I, uh, in the report, I shared about three elders that um, we were able to recognize uh, like a year and a half, almost two years ago now. Well, before that, there was two men, uh, about two years before that, that we were, Steve and I were praying about, Lord, would you have these men be the, be the elders? They're already doing the work. Um, one of the guys was an excellent teacher. The other guy was zealous, like a zealous evangelist. And when we would have outreaches, he would take off like a day's hike away and go and tell people, we're going to have a meeting on uh, this day after the new moon. You know, five, for, you know, they count like this, so five, seven days or so, you know, five, seven days after the new moon, come and gather in Deboto. So he's going around all these different places, gathering people. You know, that wasn't the first time. He's done it many times. And... He's helped with the teaching, um, guy who's really been great. Well, um, about a month, okay, we talked to them and said, hey, uh, are you interested in uh, considering this um, idea of being an elder? Because, you know, on the first qualifications of desiring the office, right? So, and they're like, wow, that's scary. <laughs> yep, <laughs> this is pretty huge, you know? Um, and they see that Steve and I have been kind of taking that role and all that we do. But they're like, well, but God's able. And they said, yeah, that's right, he is able. And we already see you doing the work. Other people, other people see it too. So can you be praying about that for a while here? And so we'll give it some time. So a month passed. Then all of a sudden one night, a guy comes up to the, to the door and... Uh, He's knocking about midnight and he has an arrow to his chest and he just falls on the ground and he's crying. He's just sweating like, like mad and just like frantic. And I'm like, what, what's going on? And, and he began to explain what had happened. Uh, he was down in the hamlet down below and he shouldn't have been down there. And there was a lady who we knew well, who, whose husband was out in town for months. He was a jerk and she loved the Lord. And he made a proposition to her and uh, she said, no, she says, I'm, she says, I'm a child of God and you're a child of God. What are you talking about? That'd be sin against him. If you don't go and tell Rich and Steve, then I'm going to go and tell him. Is what she said. Praise the Lord for her. And so he ran up before she would go and tell and he, and he spilled the beans. Could I put the arrow away? What are you doing? You know, we're gonna we'll we'll talk about it in the morning. You know. So, yeah. So in the morning, you know, we're we're uh, sitting there, and all of a sudden the story had changed. You know, just a few hours later, how it really wasn't she misread what he was doing, and you know, he really wasn't. You know, anyway. So we had to deal with that, and it eventually came out, and he confessed everything. You know. Um, but he disqualified himself for a time, and uh, he's still not an elder. But anyway, I mean, that was heartbreaking. Um, I, we learned some things along the way. I think one of them was, well, I, I don't think we ever, we ever felt like it was some small thing, but I don't think we really committed it to the prayer like we needed to. I don't think we really understood what we we're getting ourselves into. Like the enemy, we knew all along the way that this is, this is enemy's territory, and he's now losing territory, and now if anything, he can at least tear down the believers. So how important it is for having elders in the church to lead. And, and he knew that. So the timing was just crazy that this guy, after walking with the Lord for five years straight, and this would happen, you know, just like mind-blowing for us. So, you know, the discipleship process, you know, crazy messy um, really disappointing a lot of times, you know, but 
just seeing that and coming back to this idea of, of necessity. There wasn't really any other option. You know, we didn't want to live there forever. Um, and I think that's kind of how we're supposed to think about this stuff, you know? We're supposed to think about that. I'm not going to do this forever, you know? There's other things the Lord wants, to, wants me to be involved with. I can go and start an assembly somewhere else. I can go and pour in these people who are hurting, you know, and make disciples there. Or, you know, I think that, that has really been something that I don't want to lose. And if I do, you guys can, can uh, kick me in the behind. Or you can tap me on the shoulder too, but either one. I, I, you know, that, that urgency of understanding this is like, this is what it's meant to be. Now I realize that, okay, principles, and there are some principles that you know, we can consider, but I think one of them is uh, age. Okay, how old do you have to be? Like when we're talking about making disciples, you know, having clear objectives, super important. Okay, so if we're wanting to see ourselves and, and being able to fully entrust the responsibility of, say, being elders. Okay, this is, that's we look at the, that's like the top tier responsibility in, in the local assembly, elders. Or deacons, that's like also huge, right? Okay, so we got these responsibilities to entrust and start picturing in our minds what do those kind of people look like that can, can be entrusted with that kind of responsibility. Like how much gray hair do they need to have, you know? Um, let me read something to you. It's kind of interesting. Um, it's relating the significance of the age 30 for Jews. Um, in the New Testament, a great deal of space is given to Jesus' birth, but then until his appearance in the temple at age 12, almost nothing. And then from age 12, remember at 12, he's like, like he's like blowing away the minds of the religious leaders, like the knowledge of this young boy. But at the age of 12 until he began his public ministry, about the age of 30, again, nothing. So all that span of 18 years, we don't know what, really what all he was doing. But what was Jesus doing in his early childhood and in his adolescence? We have a very strong indication from a tractate or a chapter in the Mishnah, which was the Jewish oral law. It says the passage is interesting as it is pertinent, and here it goes. At five years of age, one is ready for the study of Scripture. At 10 years of age, one is fit for the study of Mishnah, the oral law. At the age of 13, for bar mitzvah. So that's kind of like where a boy is seen as an adult person who takes responsibility, right? own, has to own up to what he's, he chooses to do. At the age of 15, for the study of the Talmud. And at the age of 18, for marriage. At the age of 20, for pursuing a vocation and then at the age of 30 for entering into one's full vigor. So that, I thought it was interesting, like maybe that's perhaps why Christ had waited till he was 30 years old, you know, reaching a place in a society that that's how they viewed it. You're now at a place where you have the right to be hurt, you know? Um, and so him submitting himself to, to that culture and that foundation that's already there in the society. But that's interesting now, at 30 years old, I, I think in some ways in assemblies, we, our standards is like way beyond that, you know? It's like 60, you know? <laughs> um, and, I, you know, I think it really does matter when we think about who are, are we going to pour ourselves into? Who are we going to make disciples of? Because I think we could start so much younger than we do. Um, the average age of the guys that um, we were able to pour ourselves into, um, uh, let me backtrack here. The 2006, we had our first evangelism. 2008, the second, which maybe 30 or 40 were added to the church there. 2010 was the, the biggest evangelism, 120 or so came from uh, even as far away as two days hike. But the majority were like within a day's those were the ones we spent most time with within a day's hike from us. They're hamlet dwellers, so they're semi-nomadic, 
you know, so to gather in one place for a long period of time is just, you just don't normally do that. But they're going to be there for two months to hear the teaching. Well, what led up to that, gathering everybody together, was a process. See, about a year and a half before that, the Moy believers, young guys, were saying, hey, can you teach our relatives? They're wanting to hear. And it was interesting. Like, we were at a, fit, at a dilemma because we, in our hearts, felt like we could just keep teaching. Steve and I could just keep being the ones in front of everybody teaching. But is that really disciple making? You know, that's evangelism maybe, but it's not really disciple making. And is that really placing us in a strategy for like fully entrusting? Not at all. You know, like if we had left after 2008 and we were gone, like all these baby believers would be like wandering around, like not knowing how to help one another and use one another's gift for the growing of the body. Like they would have been stuck in all reality. So. So what we said, you know, Steve and I both, we, we, along with Karen and Carolyn, Steve's wife, we, we prayed about this together. And we committed before the Lord. I remember this is like a lights on, light bulb moment. Committed <laughs> before the Lord. We would not do the next evangelism our, by ourselves. And that was kind of scary. Because that, what that meant is there are people who had not yet heard and that could die. And yet we felt it so important that we actually position the church so that they could be making disciples as well. So we committed to do that, and it took a year and a half. And you know what? In that year and a half, nobody died. Not one person. And people were dying all the time. So, like, we were doing a lot of the medicine and stuff. So it was totally the Lord. But by that point, a year and a half later, there was eight other co-workers, men, young men, I was hoping they'd be older men, but it was only the young ones who were ready to, to take on any responsibility. They're the ones who were the Timothys. They were the faithful. Average age of maybe 17 years old. And, and that, brothers and sisters, has like totally transformed the way I view young people. The, the, the way I view, like, when do we start discipling? Um, when are they able to carry responsibility? And I believe it's way sooner than we realize, you know. And I, and again, just challenged with what I, you know. I'm just recently looking at with uh, about even Jewish Jewish culture, you know. So. So anyway, the Lord used these guys in a huge way, and that was really a turning point for the church. And in, in 2010, at that evangelism, you know, discipleship wasn't done. It was us teaching together, and there was a lot of discipleship opportunities along the way as we were going through that time, and it was really difficult. But out of it came about 80 new believers. Uh, one of the teachers barely made it to the end, and then he left, and he didn't come back for like two years, went into sin. You know, things that break your heart along the way, but thankfully, some stuck it out, and they kept going, and those guys kept discipling. They began to take these new believers then and disciple them, just like we had done for them. So... You know, the process, um, you know, the Lord had used, uh, you know, through just not knowing what we're doing and asking the Lord for wisdom along the way, but he began to solidify in our minds maybe how things can be done and, and how to look at things differently. Um, and how a lot of that, I realize it applies everywhere. Um, and, uh, you know, I guess we talk about principles one of the things that I learned that was really hard for me because I, I tend to be perfectionist on a lot of things. Um, not everything, and I, I realize that about perfectionist people. They're not perfectionists on everything, but <laughs> I like it's it takes all that's in me to let things just be okay when it's not done like when you the way you feel like it should be done, you know. Um, and especially like you're in your handling God's word, and when they're just starting off. I think we could be like, well, this is God's word. This is so important. You know, you know, you're, you're not ready yet. You're not ready yet. You're not ready yet. You know, 50 years old. You're not ready yet. You know, we can, somewhere along the lines, um, I think we've got to let people 
make mistakes. Let, let them, but, but if you provide that level of accountability with them, you're there with them, then it's okay, you know? Um, so some of the steps that like solidified as somebody wiser than me had shared uh, four stages for <clears throat> entrusting. Uh, the first one is to model. So to, to model it, um, I think really important. Um, the, the second one is to allow part participation. So it, it can't be the constant modeling, you know, um, and never giving people the opportunity to get their feet wet. So somewhere along the lines that has to happen to, to allow participation, but you know, we're sharing the responsibility with them then. Um, and then here's the actual, yeah, moving more towards entrusting then, is, is now we let them do it without us doing it with them. But we're, we're observing them, we're, we're supervising. So that being a third. Um, and I think that's really important because it's not like, okay, I've done it and now you've done it with me and now you're out on your own, you know, because they haven't done it by themselves. And that's a whole next step of maturing, of growth, you know, to do something by yourself. It's great to have at that time where, hey, somebody to b bounce it off of, you know, did I, how did I do today? You know, that kind of thing, really important. And then finally, and, and the last part is full and trusting, you know, where you're letting them do it on their own and you don't even need to be there. So that's what Second Timothy 2.2 is about. That's the end goal. And it's not having people who do it just like us. You know, nobody's just like us. Um, letting God use their gifts, but we're looking for faithful people who will be able to in turn do it for others also, right? I mean, that's, that's the heart of it. So I think we gotta be realistic about it. Um, you know, we don't wanna give something too early. There's warning in scripture about that, but again, we don't wanna just keep holding on to something when it really does need to be passed on. So yeah, just uh, allowing that process to, to happen.